All right, so let's begin. So as I said, this is um, this is January twenty seventeen paper one, right? Not the choice, people. Uh, let's start. Okay, so the first question: Resolution determines the clarity of the image displayed on a computer. The term resolution refers to the number of pixels a that makes up the color. Um, Arrange vertically on the screen, arrange horizontally screen, or arrange in a unit area of the screen. What do you all think that answer is? What will be the answer for question one? So what number? One. Question one. Resolution um, determines the character of the image display on the monitor. The term resolution refers to the number of pixels and it has um, it has some option. So D. D. Yes. D. A range in the unit area for screen. No. Uh, what happens is uh, the pixels or the number of pixels uh, determines how well they said the clarity, right? So the quality of the um, the image would be determined by the pixels. So if you have more pixels in a unit area, uh, the clearer or the better quality the image will be, right? Um, so the answer for number one is question two: Which of the following operations displays results? Input, output, storage, and processing. B, sir. Yes, output, right? Uh, remember when we did the uh, IPO chat, when we have a problem, the output is used to print information uh, to the screen to the user. So if we're doing um, a sum of two numbers, the, the input will be the two numbers, number one, number two. Processing would be the addition of the numbers and the output would be the sum, which will be printed to the screen, right? <clears throat> so output displays um, results. Question three. Of the storage devices listed below, which group does not use laser technology? Yes, sir. Right. So we have um, CD, DVD, flash drive, CD floppy disk, flash drive, hard disk, floppy disk, magnetic tape, magnetic tape, memory card, and DVD. Now, the thing to remember, laser technology is used by optical disks. Therefore, um, any option that has an optical disk uh, will, is not... Um, won't be the answer, right? And optical discs are CDs, DVDs, um, well, CDs and DVDs based on the question we have here. So the answer for this one is C, hard disk, floppy disk. And... Okay, so the answer is C. All right, question four. Uh, a set of data that is waiting to be either processed or output is stored in a temporary block of memory called a B, sir, acceptor. All right. Um, anyone, everybody agrees with that? Yes. So that's the answer, right? Acceptor. Okay. Um, Question five, which of the following processing modes is used for processing utility bills? So we have real time, multitasking, time share, and batch processing. Um, 
So the answer is D. D, yeah, batch processing. Now, real time processing has to do when there is a, there is a, a, a processing waiting on some sort of input, right? So if it is you enter a password or there's input from a sensor waiting, okay? Use real time processing. Multitasking is when you're doing multiple or completing multiple activities at the same time. Time sharing is when you allocate different times for different activities, right? Uh, batch processing is like um, uh, processing a huge amount of documents at the same time. So that's generally like utility bit. Okay, so the answer for number five is, is the, Okay, so let's move on to number six. Which of the following devices is an example of a manual input device? So I thought you could want Yes, yes, a touch screen um, monitor because with the touchscreen monitor, you are able to enter the, or you will have to enter the information manually, right? Uh, the barcode reader, once you scan the barcode, the information is automatically entered in the system. Because remember, uh, a barcode, or when you scan the barcode, the lines um, of different um, thickness that actually translate to some numbers, right? So when you scan the barcode, it's automatically translated to the numbers. Um, the speaker, well, that's an output device, and a plotter is an output device. So that's the um, that's reason behind it, the answer being E. Okay, number seven. Which part of the central processing unit, the CPU, coordinates its activity? B, so the control unit. Yes, B, the control unit. Uh, the register, no, not sure that, um, that that would be applicable. Control unit, yes, that is the part that con um, coordinates activities. Main memory, that's for storing an uh, arithmetic logic unit. Uh, that's for performing calculation, right? Okay, number eight, the processing mode um, that allows one CPU to run many applications at the same time, called? The D. Was that D? D. D, yeah, multiprocessing, right? So as we briefly spoke about before, <clears throat> uh, multiprocessing uh, allows multiple activities or multiple applications to be run at the same time, right? Just to go over it again, time sharing, um, only one activity could be run at the same time, but um, the, uh, it's, some time is allocated to different activities. So if you have three activities, A, B, and C, you might have 10 seconds for activity A, 15 seconds for B, 10 seconds for C, right? So that's how time sharing is on. Batch processing, as mentioned before, that's where something is dealt with in a batch like printing utility bills and real-time processing is when um, some input is required in order to further um, process or for the next steps to occur. Okay, here we go, nine. Which of the following types of technology is commonly used by banks to read data on checks? So you see. C O M R. Um, anybody else want to try? B C R. B O C R. Some people say um, M I C R. So different persons say different things, right? Okay, so let's just go with um, P O S. That's most probably there for point of seal. So that's not applicable here, right? We have O C R, which is optical character recognition. Um, in the case of the checks on banks, um, that's, that's not it. Uh, optical mark reader, uh, that's the one to detect um, 
areas of, that are shaded. So for example, the correction and the multiple choice like, um, answers, right? When you show the answers. And then I have MICR, um, which is magnetic egg character recognition. The answer for number nine is D, okay? M-I-C-R. Okay, let's um, think to number 10, right? A socket which is provided in a computer to allow for additional components is known as what? Fire wire, system bus, expansion card, or expansion slot. B. We have B as one of the answers. Anybody else want to answer? Okay, so firewire is used to basically connecting, right? Um, two devices. The system bus is, is a component on the motherboard that is used to communicate. Uh, then you have expansion card and expansion slot. Um, so what happened is the expansion card is the device itself, the additional component itself and the expansion slot is what is used to connect expansion cards, right? So the answer for this one will be D. Okay. Um, everybody, everybody clear on that? Yes, sir. Expansion card and expansion slot might have um, confused things a bit, but you have to remember the card is what is the additional component itself, right? So it's like if you want to put um, uh, 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 another graphics card into your computer, right? Or you want to put a wireless um, access card into your computer, that's the additional component. Uh, the expansion slot will be on the hard, um, on the motherboard itself. All right, let's, um, let's continue. Cable transmission media do not include Coax fiber optic satellite is the pit. Caesar satellite. Yes, satellite, right? Everything else has uh is everything else has a wire or cable. Right? So coaxial cable, fiber optics, you have a cable for that. Uh, satellite is wireless and twisted gear, uh, twisted gear cable. Okay, 12. Which of the following is not a physical access restriction? You have encryption, security guard, biometric system, fire and waterproof uh, caveat. Yes, sir, encryption. All right. Encryption is, yes, encryption, right? Because it is a um, software access restriction that's used to, try, um, to convert your the data from the sender into a format that cannot be easily understood. Okay, so that's done by software. Um, the security guard, of course, that's physical. That's a physical person uh, protecting um, access. Uh, biometric system, that's a physical device, right? The biometric system is a physical device that you use um, your uh, fingerprint or um, retina scan to access something. So that's a physical access. And then, of course, the fire and waterproof cabinet. That's a physical um, equipment there that has to be, um, that has to be open physically in order to access what's inside. Okay, so we're on to 13. Um, and question 13 refers to this diagram here. And they're uh, asking, the diagram above represents a what button window pop-up menu, pull down menu. So the right. So the answer is is the pull down menu. Now a button would be like a um, a radio button. Uh, sorry, a button would be. Um, like a button that has maybe like submit or cancel or okay, that that's a, a button it's like an icon. Um, the window we all know the window like uh, the explorer window. Um, 
pop-up menu. Uh, if you click or select a, a, an item and a new window opens or a new a menu opens and the, the pull down, um, when you click on like file or edit on general programs like, like I'm doing here, and you see um, options shown, right? So that's your pull down menu. So what do you want when you like right click or left click? Which one that one? This like this? Yes, sir. Yeah, this would be like a, a pop up. Right? Because it shows anywhere that you, you click. So that'll be like a pop up menu. Okay. Um the the thing to remember this all the oh, what to note about this question also is this looks similar to one of those uh like a generic uh, productivity menu. So something from Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Word or like Adobe, right? Uh, and you can relate to that being there. Yes, uh, morning, Lennon, you have a, you want to? Hi, Afras, morning. Um, could you morning. just stop the recording for like two seconds? Let me just address the students, please. Sure, I'll, okay, recording is. All right, so let us continue. Oh, question 40. <clears throat> Which of the following um, provides the slowest internet access? We have T1 network dial up and digital subscriber line or DSL. Yes, right. So the answer, um, the answer for this is DSL or digital subscriber line, right? So it will go dial up as the slowest um network um well in general a, a network is not um a, one of these technologies right um team one line is next and dsl or digital subscriber line is the fastest of, of them all right so uh 14 is B. okay let's move on to 15. The illegal copying and selling of programs is referred to as. So, where is it 14, yes, sir? 14 is D, the digital subscriber line, DSL. All right. Okay. Um, okay, so number 15. The illegal copying and selling of programs is referred to as. We have propaganda, software piracy, fraud, and industrial espionage. Yes, sir. Software piracy. Right, so the answer is B, right? Um, software piracy is is just that, right? Um, copying and selling programs or software without the permission of the of the owner or author of it. <clears throat> right. Um, Sixteen. Which of the following is true about an intranet? Offers unlimited access allows access to suppliers, allows access to employees, offers limited access to employees and suppliers. Yes, allows access to employees. Right, so remember that an intranet is something that provides access um, internal to the company, right? So therefore offers a unlimited access. No, that's not correct because it is possible to have an intranet and, and the employees or persons using the internet does not have access to the internet, right? Or any networks outside of the company. <clears throat> Allows access to suppliers. Um, uh, that, yes, is possible. Um, but if, you, if it is suppliers allowed access to a company's <clears throat> internal intranet, then that will be an extranet, right? <clears throat> Allows access to employees. Yes, it does allow access to employees because, as we've mentioned before, it's an internal network. And then D offers limited access to employees and suppliers. So the first part of that question is true, in which that it offers limited access to employees, but not suppliers. So remember when answering the questions to um, choose the most suitable one. So just again, the answer for that one is C. All right, let's move on to 17. 
an electronic point of sale system may most likely not be found in um, an office, pharmacy, supermarket, or appliance store. So when they say office, right? What kind of office do you mean? Like? Right. So this is the thing, right? Um, you have to try your best to interpret based on the on the question. So if you're given us an exam, which answer would you choose? Just based on you reading it and your interpretation. Our officer. Yeah. yeah, because you see the question is valid. Um, because the office could be an office that sells, right? And in, in or or sales takes place there. So a point of sale system could be there. But compared to a pharmacy where you definitely know um there's um there's that buy uh well they're selling to customers a supermarket where yes persons go there to buy um food stuff an appliance store where persons go to purchase appliances the office is the one that is most likely not to have uh epos all right so 17 the answer is eight we have 18 a type of utility program used to remove application programs is file compression, troubleshooting, antivirus, uninstall program. Anyone? What what um, is a type of utility program used to remove application program? Should be. Yeah, uninstall, right? Remember with on uh, computer systems and you know your laptop, for example, it might have be most applicable to it. When you remove a program, you're te technically you're uninstalling the program. So that would be the answer, right? The file compression, well, you all are familiar with file compression. We use it a lot when you were submitting SPAs, right? That, that will um, uh, compress or make the file or folder smaller in size. A uh, troubleshooting program will help you troubleshoot or resolve issues. And an antivirus program will um, scan and protect your computer from virus, viruses or malware. Okay. Question 19. Um, anyone can answer question 19? So the answer is A. Answer is what? A. Two. A. Uh, the answer for 19 is, is 5, right? C. Um, but just to note on 19, remember that this topic in particular will not be um, will not be assessed in your exam, right? So you um, you don't Sorry. read it. Yes, Santa? The answer is C. Correct, yes, that's right. The answer is C5. Uh, but <clears throat> remember that this topic is not part of the syllabus for your exam that, that you're going to be writing. So if you don't know how to convert from binary to decimal, um, that's okay, right? And you don't have to do too much practicing on it for the exam. Let's move on um, to 20. So working from home and linking to the office computer system to submit work is described as teleconferencing, telecommuting, telemarketing, and teleworking. Is it B? Yes, B. Um, this, is, this term is, is used a lot in news um, right now, okay? Uh, persons are doing a lot of telecommuting. Uh, that is basically working from home. Um, uh, teleconferencing is, would refer to, you know, if you have like a, a call, I have all the persons on the call, right? So telecommuting is the is the actual term. All right, twenty one. Which device is essential for computer control systems to function with precision in an assembly line? Um, these two sensor. Right. So the answer is the sensor, right? Now, uh, a microphone, uh, you don't really need that in the assembly line. You know, normally in the assembly line, you program machines to 
um, to perform a certain task and the machines do it. So you don't really have to tell the machines to do, to do the task, right? Um, a speaker, um, that, could be, that could be something in the assembly line, but the speaker is an output device. So it's more, uh, more in terms of there's an alarm, <laughs> the speaker will be used to, to probably highlight a signal that um, a camera, a camera is something that could be used in assembly line. Uh, maybe the uh, the machines would need to view or or, or uh, check the status of something. Um, but the most appropriate answer there is the sensor because the sensor will look for uh, or sense a particular parameter. So, for example, wheat. Um, if it is your there's an assembly line for packaging um, some sort of um, some, maybe a food stuff, right? So it's packaging flour in bags. So the sensor is used to ensure that the amount of flour that's put in the bag is, is um, you know, like one kilogram or five kilograms. Okay. Uh, everyone understand? Any questions on that? No, sir. Okay, good. Um, let's move on. Question 22. Which of the following checks is a data verification method? DSO visual. Right. So remember, when we refer to checks and data checks, there are normally two categories, right? There is. Um, verification and I remember the other one double data entry double entry well validation is the other one right um there's two categories the main categories and in verification there are two checks there's a visual check um right and then there's the double data entry check and in the validation that's where you have a uh, 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 the multiple ones so you have range check um you have uh, length, data type, you have um, reasonableness check. Okay, so based on that, the verification method um, in this option is the visual, and that that's E. Now, uh, remember to um, you could review the validation and verification checks because um, so it's a bit tricky, and uh, you need to be clear on which ones. Uh, a validation, which ones are verification, and then what each one means. So, for example, um, which check um, ensures that you know you don't have, let's say, you're filling out a, a form um, to to go to school, right? To apply for school, and the form has the number of siblings you attend the school, and you put something like uh, three hundred. Which sort of check will who sort of check will pick that up? Right, that's the reasonableness check, right? So it's important to understand the different types of checks and what they what they what they look for. Okay, so let's move on to 23. Um, we have a string of binary digits there, right? One zero one one zero zero one, and that is an example of raw data, sorted data, information, or secondary data. Raw data, sir. Okay. okay, yes. So the answer for that is raw data. Um, remember, raw data is just a bunch of numbers or a bunch of letters, right? Um, there's no real meaning to it. And this is just a string of binary digits. So this is raw data. And when that data is processed, then it goes into or it becomes information. So the answer for 23 is A, raw data. Um, all right, so 24. Which of the following functions performs calculation in a computer? So is D. Yes, processing, right? Um, we go, if we go back to the example and one we always use about the sum of two numbers, um, 
uh, or writing a program to calculate sum of two numbers, the two numbers will be the input to the program, the output will be the sum, and the processing is actually calculating the sum of the numbers. So answer for 24 is D. All right, uh, let's move on to 25. Records on magnetic tape are stored in what way? We have it that so yes, it's in the What letter? A. A. Um, any other I any other one? D. D. B. Yeah. Right. So remember when you're speaking about man magnetic tape, um, the best way to think about it is those older um cassette tapes, right? And in order to access well for the tapes, in order to access um audio. You have to go through the tape in, in an order. So the answer for B is sequentially. Basically, what is recorded first will be played first. Okay, so 25 is B. Um, I just want to remind everyone uh, what you could do. Um, if it is uh, it's, who does not want to use the mic to give the solutions, they could add the, put the solutions on the chat, right? Uh, what... Um, to make it a little more understandable, you could put the question number and then the answer or the answer you're choosing. All right, so let's move on to 26. What is the function of a network of computers? Uh, we have some options there. So we have organizes data among computers, receives data from one computer, obtain, I'm sorry, allows users to obtain data from a central computer or enables two or more computers to communicate. Right, anyone? Any answers? No. Um, any answers on this one? A, B, C, or D? D, sir. D, yes. So remember, a network is um, the connection or is a connection facilitating communication um, between two or more computers. Right. Um, it does not organize data. That's probably something like a, a database, right? Uh, that will organize data on computers. Receives data from one computer. Um, no, because you have multiple computers on a network, right? Um, allows users to obtain data from a central computer. Uh, no, um, again, because you have multiple computers in the network, right? And if you think about it at home. So at home you have your you know your laptop, your eyes, your phone, your tablet, etc. on on the network. And generally speaking, all those devices could communicate with each other on your network. All right, let's move on to twenty seven. Uh, twenty seven refers to the following types. Excuse of me. Yes. Um, I'm going to the washroom. Okay, which which question you missed? Hello? Which question you missed? He said he going to the washroom. Oh, he, okay, okay. I thought he went. All right. Um, okay, item 27, right? Let's, let's move on to that. Um, so item 27 refers to the following types of memory. We have RAM, we have ROM, RAM, and EEPROM. Which of the above types of memory and non volatile, and they have different combinations. Of them. Okay, first of all, right, um, what do they mean by non volatile? Could anyone explain what is meant when it's speaking about memory and the city memory is non volatile? Um, non volatile means like um, 
it is studied uh, temporarily. Right. Um, well, actually, uh, volat that is volatile. Volatile is when it stores data temporarily, right? Um, Non-volatile is, is permanent. So for example, if you have a computer and you have data stored um, in, in a part of memory and if the computer is switched off, uh, the data is lost, that is that memory is, is referred to as volatile. So volat non-volatile is the opposite. <clears throat> so you're talking about uh, more permanent storage of data, right? So that's the first thing. The second um, part is they have different types of memory. So you have ROM, RAM, and EPROC, right? Um, every, uh, everyone remembers what the acronyms are. Now, we know ROM is read-only memory. Uh, RAM is random access memory. What about EPROM? E-P-R-O-M. And remember EEPROM? EEPROM, electronic programmable read-only memory, right? So that's where you have a ROM disk, but you could program it. Yeah, so programmable read-only memory, right? You have a ROM disk that you can program, okay? Um, and out of those three, um, the types of memory, that are non-volatile are one and three, okay? ROM and EEPROM. All right, everybody clear on that? Any questions on it? No, sir. No, everybody clear? Okay, good. All right. Let's move on to 28. Which access method is used to retrieve data from a flash drive? Right, so we have direct, serial, sequential, and indexed sequential. Yeah, you remember for flash drives, um, data could be accessed directly, right? That's that's one of the main um, points of it, and that's why flash drives it's it's much faster to copy data on the flash drive than other de other devices. Okay, so the answer for twenty eight is A. All right, twenty nine. Which type of interface allows the user to communicate with the computer system by keying in instruction? Come on, everyone. Right. So this is a this is input, right? So this is how you input data into your computer system. Um, so you have basically three types of ways to, to put data in the system, right? You have menu driven, right? There's a graphical user um, interface, so using graphics, uh, command driven, and well, touch sensitive is not even uh, part of a, a method, really. Um, in menu driven, there's usually a, a menu or there's list of options that you would select, okay? Uh, so, for example, a kiosk. So, you can only select what options are on the screen. So, that's menu driven. Um, graphical user interface allows you to point and click on different um, icons on the screen. Uh, that's what we typically use when we use our, our Windows operating system. Right? And then there's command driven, uh, where you have to type in the command. Right? Um, so, the answer for 29 will be will be C because they say you're gonna key in instructions, which means you're gonna be typing in the instructions with your, your keyboard. 29 is C. All right, let's move on to two. Which of the following is or are advanced? Excuse me, you can just repeat the answer for 26 and 27, please. No shorting. Uh for 26, the answer is, is D. 
and 27, the answer is, is B. You got 28, Salim? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. All right, so let's move back to 30. Which of the following is or are advantages of processing, of information processing? One, retraining of staff. Two, reducing human intervention. Three, increasing the amount of equipment needed. So considering these three options, what do you consider an advantage or advantages of information processing? So is this sir. Uh... So um, we have here, we have here some different options that are the impact to the company when they introduce information processing, right? So information so processing. So the answer is C, one and two. One, two, okay. So we have, we have C and D as options, right? Now, when we looking at um, advantages, we're talking about the, the um, business perspective and the changes they have to make or it, how it impacts their, their business, right? So if a company has to retrain staff, right? Um, that is something that they have to spend money on, spend time on. They have to take away from the production, right? So, so that's, the answer is to be reducing human intervention. Right. So the answer is B, right? But just to go back a little bit, the reason why one is not an advantage is that uh, retraining staff actually takes away from the company um, in terms of time and money for training staff. Reducing human intervention, that's an advantage because why? Because if you have systems in place to do information processing, you could basically, um, you, you could be more efficient, right? Meaning um, that uh, system could be running um, uh, or working more hours than a typical person. You know, it's less prone to errors and um, um, well, human errors, that is, right? So that's an advantage, definitely, number two. Um, increasing the amount of equipment needed, that will be considered a disadvantage because um, the company has to spend money um, on equipment or additional components. So the answer for 30 is B, two only, right? All right, so 31, we have a little algorithm there. I'm gonna give you all a couple of minutes to, to work that out. And if you just tell me what the answer for 31 is. Uh, those who completed, they could put the answer in, in the chat. All right, so I've seen a couple answers coming in. Uh, right, so let's go through it, right? So we have y is assigned the value of five okay so y is five then we say x is assigned the value of y so that means x is also five and then y is assigned the value of 10 so the new value for y is 10 so x is five y is 10 and then the line after that z is equal to three so we have x is five y is 10 z is three um, the x or x is now assigned the current value of x plus y, which is five um, plus 10, which is 15, okay? So x is now equal to 15, and y is assigned to 
x, which is 15 minus z, which is 3. So y is equal to 15 minus 3, 12. And then you have z being equal to x, which is 15, y, 12, and z, 3. And that is 30. So the answer for 31 is d, 15, 12, and 30. Anyone not clear on this, I would like me to explain it again. Everybody okay on the answer? Okay, okay. All right. Um, if anybody wants you to explain, you could just let me know. Okay, and I'll, I'll move on to question 32. <laughs> All right. So, the most appropriate data type for so storing the amount of interest earned on a sum of money is what? We have a string. Right, so you have real character, string, and integer. Yes, yeah, so you want to know the most appropriate data type for storing the amount of um, interest earned on a sum of money. Uh, so the first thing to, to note about that is you're dealing with money, which is a, a numerical value, and therefore the amount of interest will be numerical also. Right? Right, so we have there um, a number. So we're looking at inter between integer and real character. And string is out because there we no letters involved, right? Now, uh, given that we're dealing with uh, with monetary value, it will have dollars and cents, which means you want a decimal um, or your numbers after the decimal point. So the answer for this would be real, as integer only those whole numbers, right? So the answer for 32 is E, um, real. Okay, so we have a question on Pascal, which is 33. And um, this question or questions like this will not come in the exam because it's a Pascal specific question. And the programming language or questions related to the programming language specifically is, is no longer a requirement, right? Um, similar for 34, that is a Pascal specific question, right? Okay, so 35. What does this symbol, and you have a diamond there, represent in IT? Right, so the question they're asking is, what the symbol represents in information technology, and more specifically, what does it represent in flowcharts, right? And as you know, we have different symbols in flowcharts to, um, to signify different parts of the, the process. And the diamond symbol is a decision uh, where inside that you determine if a criteria is met. So for example, if, um, if your grade or if your mark is greater than 50, then you do some, some uh, another operation. So the answer for 35 is B. All right, uh, let's move on to 36. Which of the following is not a characteristic of pseudocode? Says D. Yes, uh, because a pseudocode is it, it is precise. Yes, a pseudocode has to be precise. Um, unambiguous. Yes, there's no ambiguity in a pseudocode. Um, it has a finite number of steps. Again, yes, that is a pseudocode. Uh, a graphical interface of the solution. Um, that is the that is not a characteristic as what you call a graphical interface of a solution as a flow chart. Okay, so the answer for 36 is D. Um, all right, let's move on to 37. The purpose of inserting comments with program code is to do what? So which one of those options represent the purpose of inserting comments? Okay, so 
you all remember when you did the program in part of the SBA or the program implementation, um, you, you put comments in your code. And you have to remember that these comments were not um, executed. The program didn't look at these, the text you, you wrote there, right? So in terms of affecting the operational program, comments does not affect that. So the first option there, allow the user to input data. No, um, comments will not uh, have any impact on that. Uh, provide explanatory program. That is exactly why we use comments to provide an uh, explanation uh, of the program. So why we did uh, a certain for loop or why loop or why this variable was created, you know, ex little um, comments explaining portions of the code. Uh, ensure the program compiles correct. Um, completely no. Uh, as mentioned before, um, comments have no impact or effect on the program itself. Uh, provide information on special features of the program. Um, you may be tempted to select that one, but um, not, not really special features. It more explains what the program does, right? So your answer for 37 is B. All right, so we have 38 and 39 um, referring to fragments of Pascal code. And again, um, this, this will not be applicable to, to you. Okay, so we're going to skip those two questions. And we're going to go to 40. Uh, question 40 uh, refers to the algorithm. And they want to know which line contains a processing statement. There's one. All right, any other C. answers? We have one, we have A, we have C. C, sir. C again. All right, so one is saying to write enterprise. And that you would, that will be a, um, or an output statement because you're going to be writing enterprise or printing it to the screen. So that's output. Then you're going to read price. Uh, what's going to happen there is the program will be waiting on input from the or the user to enter um, uh, the price on the, on the command prompt, and it's going to input that into the program. So that's an input statement. Then we have uh, line three, which is a calculation statement, right? So VAT is equal to price multiplied by fifteen percent. And um, that there is your processing statement, line three. Four, again, is to write something. So that's another output. Okay, so the answer of 40 is C, line three. All right, so let's move on to 41. A trace table is used for which one of those actions there? A. Okay, so we have um, testing algorithm, declaring an array, coding an algorithm, representing an algorithm. Uh, now, if you remember when you all did the trace table for the SBA, the trace table was used to um, simulate the output or simulate how your program would work. So you had to put um, input values and then go through how um, that will impact the variables in your in your algorithm. So uh, trace table is used for A, testing an algorithm. Okay, 42. The first step in solving a problem is to run. Test the solution, define the problem, evaluate the solution, or develop the algorithm for the problem. Says so B. Right, so the first step in solving is, is yes, B, define the problem, right? Now, after you define the problem, what is the next step you would take based on these four options? So D. Right, develop the algorithm. Let me see. Right. So yes, so after you define the problem, 
the next step you would look at or oh, next step would be um, looking uh, at different ways to solve it and then identify the most appropriate. So it will be C, right? You evaluate the solution. After you do that, then you develop the algorithm and then you test the solution. All right, 43 refers to the information about programming, compiling to create the object code, creating the source code, yeah. executing to sure. test for accuracy. Um, and then the question is, what is the correct sequence for the above steps in the development of a, of a program? Right, so you for this, think about the program you created, right? Uh, what did you do regarding the program itself? So the first thing everyone did was what? They created the source code. Uh, the source code was when you opened um, uh, the Lazarus, the program, the password program there, and you typed the code. <clears throat> so that's creating the source code. After you create the source code, then you, um, did what? You had to compile the code to create the object code, right? And this is when you, you click compile and then once it compiles successfully without any errors, then you could execute the, the, the program and test factors. So then you put in your input data and ensure it works properly. So the answer would be uh, creating a source code, then compiling to create the object code and then executing the test accuracy. Two, one, and then three. So the answer is C. All right, 44. Machine language is characterized as what? What generation language? Mm -hmm. So the first thing to note is what is machine language? Uh, how is it represented, right? So machine language is um, machine language is in a form that the computer, the machine could understand. So we're looking at probably zeros and ones, right? And that is the you know the most basic form that the language could be. So the answer for this would be a first generation language. Okay, so machine language is a first generation language. Um, what you remember about the generation of languages is the higher you go, meaning first, second, third, fourth, the more human readable it is, right? So it, it, um, it's, more, it's easier to interpret or humans to interpret the higher you go. All right, let's move on to 45. Program testing can be described as what? So we have three options. Checking that all documentation is including the program. That's the first one, first one. The second one, executing the program manually with input values to see the results. And then you have the third option, running the program using simple data to identify errors in the program. So program testing is described as one. So, okay. So checking that all documentation is included in the program that is not really a part of program testing, right? Um, the documentation, what they're speaking about here is ensuring you have your comments and all these things, right? That's the program documentation itself. Um, the second one, executing the program manually with input values to see results. Yes, you would want to do that, right? Uh, manually means, you know, testing it like with a, a trace table. Right, reviewing the program and then run a program using simple data to identify errors. This is when you uh, execute your program and then you put um, some information in there to test to make sure it works properly. Uh, generally, you would use the same information you tested using your trace table. Right, so the answer for this one 45 is C, two and three. Okay, let's move on to 46. Extracting information from a database can be achieved through the use of what? 
files, objects, queries, or reports. So just looking at this, there are two possible options, right? Now files, um, no, you don't extract the um, information using files or objects, right? It could be a query. Remember you run a query. So for example, determine the number of participants that, um, or the number of guests that shows a premium package and then you, you have a report, right? Now the, the difference between it is while the query, while well, both the query and the report extracts information from the database, um, you want to look for something like um, if uh, the information is sort of summarized, right? Then, then it's a report. So um, in a report, you could actually um, calculate sums, totals, averages, and these sorts of things and display, right? So just for extracting information from a database, that answer will be a query. This is the answer 46. So the most appropriate answer 46 is C. Okay, you still on some database stuff here. A single row of data in a database is called what? Sir, B. All right, so we have a single row of data. Single row of data in a database, right? Now, remember now that um, the table, right? The table is what you first um, create to capture all information. And within your table, you will have fields, okay? So first name, last name, email address, telephone number, right? So that's a field. Um, the entire database itself is going to be stored, or the entire database itself is referred to as the file. Um, uh, each line of data, right? So if you have someone's first name, someone's last name, John Smith, and you have his age, 23 years, and his email address, johnsmith at gmail.com, that row of information is called a record. So the answer for 47 is a record. Okay. All right, let's move on to 48. Dollar sign A, dollar sign 3 is an example of what type of addressing mechanism? So we have here a couple, I don't know if you all see. So we have red addressing, relative addressing, formula addressing, and absolute addressing. The first thing to identify this sort of question refers to what topic or what application are we using? Anyone, what program are we using? What are they speaking about? Microsoft Excel, right? Yes, yes, so Microsoft Excel. Um, and this is this notation is used when you want to refer to uh um yeah this notation is when you want to refer to a um to a cell in your spreadsheet so there are two two when you refer to a cell there are two is you can refer to the cell either relative okay um or absolute and the, when you place the dollar signs before the cell, the column and row value, um, it is called absolute addressing. Therefore, if you copy the formula um, to another cell, the value doesn't change. So it's absolute addressing. So the answer 48 is D, and the topic is um, spreadsheet. All right, let's move on to 49. All 
right? So 49 refers to this spreadsheet here. I hope you all can see it clearly. And question 49 asks, to add the values 17, 35, 45, and 39 in the spreadsheet table above, which function should be placed in cell B6? So which one of those functions should be placed in cell B6? Anyone else wants to answer 49? What will you type in B6 to add the values? So, uh, B, sir. Okay, so we have B, right? So let's go through it now. So you want to add the values, and the function in Excel is, is sum, okay? Um, there's no add function in Excel that will do that. And the count function actually counts the amount of um, cells or data in the cells. So those two are out. So we have A and B using the sum function. So you have A calculates the sum from B2 to B5, and then B calculates the sum from B2 to B6. So you have to first um, note that the values are in B2, B3, B4, and B5 and you want the function to be in B6. So therefore, it will be the sum of B2 to B5, not B6, because B6 has no, um, has no data, and that's where you want the answer to be. So the answer 49 is E. All right, E. Okay, let's move to 50. Which of the following actions is required for creating a chart in a spreadsheet. Right, so when you want to create a spreadsheet, which one of these actions did you, did you have to take? Did you have to print the data? No, there was no printing involved. Did you have to select the paper size to create a chart? No, right? Did you have to select data? Yes, you had to select data. You had to select which data you wanted in the chart. Um, and in orientation, that was not required. Okay, so you have to, the answer from 50 you see, select the data because you have to select what information you want in the chart. Um, if you wanted to, to show, um, uh, like when we did the pie chart, show any distribution of um, uh, expenditure or money spent. Uh, we had to select data first. All right, 51. The default alignment for numbers in, sp in spreadsheet is what? What is default? So by default, when you type a number in a spreadsheet, how is the alignment? Right, and that one you could test by yourself. Uh, just open up Microsoft Excel, for example. Uh, and it, it actually goes right. Okay, so it goes to the right by default. Um, text goes to the left, and uh, numbers, go, numbers go to the right. Okay, so the answer 51 is B. Okay, so we have another spreadsheet here, um, question 52. Right, uh, the spreadsheet uh, has been sorted by a primary field and then a secondary field. What are the primary and secondary fields respectively? So this data was sorted and they want to know what was the field or the, it was sorted by first, which is the primary field, and then what is the second field that was used to sort data, the secondary field. Anyone, um, anyone want to suggest an answer for this one? 
C. Yes, yes. All right, twenty two C. All right. Um. So, anybody else? C, C. C again. C. Okay. C. Um. All right. Let's see here. All right. Okay. So we have a table with with some headings with some fields. So first name, surname, mark one, bonus, and I have some data there, right? So they're saying spreadsheet is sorted in some way. So we're going to look for a uh, pattern, right? Um, first name, is this in any sort of, um, is this sorted in any way? You have K, you have J, you have Z and S. So it doesn't look like it has, it's sorted at all, right? So not this one. Then we have surname. You have Clark, um, Henry, Smith and Smith. So this looks like some sort of alphabetical sorting, right? And then you have, um, you have Mark 1, which has 69, 69, 71, 91. So that also looks like it has uh, a sort. And then you have bonus points. No, yes, yes, no. So this is not sorted either. So we have two fields that are sorted. Surname and Mark 1. Everybody agrees with that? Or you don't, you're still not seeing Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I agree with it. Everybody okay with that, right? So that's the first thing. You look at your data and you look for which one is, has some sort of sort. Now remember, the sort could be um, in um, descending order, meaning this could have been, this could have had Smith, Smith, Henry, and Clark. So you have to look for the ascending or descending order. That's the sort of, right? But in this case, um, the surname is in alphabetical order and the mark is in ascending order, smallest to, to largest. Uh, so we're going to look for cinema mark one. Uh, so so that, that, that is A actually, right? So 52, the answer is A, surname and mark one. All right, um, some person said C. So yes, definitely mark one is one of the fields, but bonus points is not sorted because you had no and then two yes and then another no. So that's why that will not be part of it. Okay, so the answer is A. All right, we have another question on spreadsheets. Okay, what formula should be inserted into C5 to calculate the VAT for the washer? All right, so you have, you have some items, you have uh, price, VAT, column, and total, and you have a VAT definition. And they're asking what formula should be inserted into C5 to calculate the VAT for the washer? Okay, anybody, anybody else wants to answer? All right, so how do you calculate VAT? Or was it, what would you generally calculate VAT? You would take the cost price and then multiply it by um, the, the VAT amount, right? So, just looking at the answers, um, we do not express cells in spreadsheets with the uh, rules first. So A and C is definitely out, right? Um, then you have now B, which is equal to B5, which is the uh, washer price by dollar sign, B dollar sign to 15%. And we use absolute referencing there. And then we have B5 multiplied by B2 divided by 100. Um, what you have to note in this question is that 15% is dot one five. Remember in Excel, we could do the, um, the number representation, right? And, and automatically convert digits to percentage. So the answer for B, Sorry, the answer for um, 53 is B. B5 multiplied by dollar sign, B dollar sign, two. Okay, everybody clear on that? Any questions on that one?
No. All right. Okay, so that's 53. All right, let's move to 54. <clears throat> Which of the following features allows the user to insert individual names in the primary document? Right, so some of the things to look at here, right, is they're referring uh, to a primary document and you normally refer to primary documents or that term is used when you use mail merge right and then the asking allows the user to insert individual names remember you could create one primary document a letter for example and then you could access a data source so a database table and then print multiple documents for each user now, a footer would insert um, uh, information at the bottom of a page, right? So that would be more like um, page number, could app be applicable there. Uh, headers, that inserts information at the top of the page. So that could be probably like a company logo or the document title. And then search and replace has, you know, nothing to do with really a, a formatted feature, but that looks for a string or characters and then um, changes it to another set of characters all right now what we're going to do um, I want you all for homework to attempt 55 to, to 60 okay um, uh, these fast paper well first of all everyone has access to this fast paper Anyone don't have access to this fast paper? No, so it's on Google Drive. Yes, it is on Google Drive, right? So if you go on the, the Google Drive, you will be able to access it um, in the in the in the IT folder, right? There's fast papers. And remember, this is January 2017, paper one. So um what you all could do is um just do a quick check right now who can check and just I just ensure. So, Dion, are you on your laptop? You could check real quick to see if you could access it. Okay. Yeah, just check it for me, Dion. I want to call people to check. So, Dion, Raphael, could you check? Satyam, you on a laptop or phone? Phone? Laptop. Laptop. Could you check Satyam for me, please? Does he can access it? Yeah. I want to ask that too, sir. You. Okay. So, who on your laptops? Please check the Google Drive. And I want some persons to just give me some feedback, right? Um, Hannah, you on a laptop? Hannah, you there? All right, uh, Jenna, you on a laptop? No, sir, I'm on a laptop. Phone? Okay, let me see who else. Uh, Miguel, laptop? Yeah, uh, Musa, you on a laptop? Yes, sir. You could ch just check the Google Drive for me, please. Um, so Tyreek. What was that? What to look for in Google Drive? Please? Go in the, um, go in the, go, look for this past paper. It, go in the IT folder and see if you see this past paper. 2017, January paper one. And we have Tyreek, you on a laptop? Right, okay, thanks. Check for me also. All right, so Sparks, Raphael, Tyreek, Musa, Hannah, sorry, Jenna, Dion, and Colleen, and Satyam. So, guys, let me know. Okay, so Raphael said he saw it. Yes, it is. Uh, who was that? That's Musa? Satyam. Satyam, right, so Satyam saw it. Genesis, okay, that's uh, Genesis. Where is it, sir? Wait, you have a phone? Yeah. Yes, you have a phone. Okay, right. Um, what else did I ask for you? Colleen, did you see it? 
So I'm looking for it right now, sir. All right, so it should be there. And if you don't see it, let me know. So uh, multiple students confirmed that they did find it. So it's there. So for homework, you do questions 55 to 60. Right, okay. Um, now, uh, okay. So we'll continue with um, the paper two for January, 2017. And uh, this is the first question of paper two, right? So the first question states, uh, write the appropriate name for the IT professional who performs each of the following functions. Right, so they're gonna give you um, the function of uh, a professional or a job role. And based on the function, you have to state the job role itself, right? So the first function is, determines um, access privileges for users of a database. So who is, or what is the, the IT professional that will have this function? Anyone wants to put forward an answer? Now remember, based on the question or looking at the question, they're talking about a uh, database, right? So the person would definitely have to be working with databases and based on the job rules we reviewed in class, this person will be a uh, database administrator or that suits this person all right so the answer for this is database administrator mm -hmm. all right what about repairs malfunctioning computer equipment okay based on this description a computer technician would most suit that role. All right, let's move on to B. Describe the function of each of the following units found in a computer system. So what is the function, or how would you describe the function of the control unit? So the control unit direct, directs the flow data to the CPU. Right, exactly. So the control unit um, carries out instructions in the software and directs the flow of data through the computer, right? So yeah, so that, that's applicable. Okay, what about the arithmetic logic unit? Now, this particular component performs calculations and logic operations. Okay, that's the answer for this one. Performs calculation and logic operations. What about the central processing unit itself? Now, the central processing unit is the brain of the computer and controls how the rest of the computer operates. Okay, now remember that there is a relationship between the control unit and the arithmetic logic unit and central processing unit. Right? And uh, if it is you had to do a, a, a diagram of it, it will. Yeah, I'm just pulling up the diagram here. Right, so the diagram will look like this, okay? Um, you have the CPU, and then within the CPU, the control unit and the ALU. Okay. 
Okay, everybody, everybody clear on that? Any questions on that? Okay, so those, that first question there was worth uh, 10 marks. Okay. All right. Now, the second question um, show has some binary conversions and that's, that wouldn't be tested. So all these here, um, hexadecimal, octal conversions. All right, so let's move on to question three. A technician was checking a computer to see if it needs replacement, if it needed replacement parts. State the specification for each component indicated in A to C as required. Okay, so for the first one, which is Intel Pentium 4, 64-bit, 3.6 gigahertz, I want you all to list or, or to put in the chat the word size, processor type, and the processor speed. All right, I see some answers coming in there. Um, all right, so the word size of this, based on the specification of this component is 64 bit. Okay, that's the word size. The processor type is Intel Pentium 4, and the processor speed is 3.6 gigahertz. Any questions on that? Everybody okay? All right, another component. Two gigab gigabyte, 533 megahertz SD RAM. Um, indicate the type of RAM, the memory capacity, and the speed. So, say the answer for the uh, for part A or part B. For B, say the answer. Yeah, you could, you could, if you want to say what your suggestion is. Um, speed is five hundred and thirty G H M H C. Um, the type of RAM is SD RAM, and the memory capacity is two gigabytes. Correct. Yes, that's the answer there, right? Um, so that's good. Um, now there's a third device, right? And that is a 160 gigabyte SATA hard drive, 7200 RPM. And for this, you have to I first identify the storage device, the storage capacity, the speed, and the device interface. So first thing, what device is this? What does this storage, storage device describe? Right, is a hard drive or hard disk, correct? And what is the capacity of this device? And the storage capacity is the first um, parameter there, the 160 gigabytes, right? And speed. Yes, 7200 RPM and the device interface. In other words, what 
um, is the interface it uses to connect to your computer. And the answer for that is SATA. Okay, so those are the answers for this question. Um, and that's another 10 marks there, right? Three devices have to, to um, identify different spec. Uh, any questions on this? You all want to go back on this one? No? All right, so let's move, let's move on. All right, okay. So question four, identify one input or output device that is useful for each of the following situations. And the first situation is used by the visually impaired. So you need to identify one input or output device that is used by the visually impaired. Any suggestions what it is uh, or how will a visually impaired uh, person interact with a, a computer or computing device? Think about your phone. How would a visually impaired person use a, a cell phone or get data or information on your cell phone? So, yes, yes, Kevin. Microphone or speaker? Right. So microphone or or the speaker. Spe speaker, right? So the microphone will be the example of an input device and the speaker example of an output device. So just note for the question, um, is only one mark, right? And they're only asking for one. So you could only put one of the, the answers. Okay, for the second um situation. Uh, input to output device used by the hearing impaired. Right. What would a hearing impaired person use to enter data into a computer or to, to retrieve data? Monitor. Right, so you hear the visually the, the hearing impaired person could use a monitor to view the information as output, right? In terms of entering um data, they could use a you know a keyboard or a mouse. All right. Uh what about to fly a simulation program? Right, this is you could think about this as a, a game, right? When playing a game or um a simulation program, you'll probably want to use a joystick for this. And that'll be like an input device. All right. How about to produce an electronic signature? What is a um, input or output device. How many persons here went and um, applied for a passport or the ID card recently? Anybody remember signing on um, signing on a device that produced a digital um, signature for you? Uh, ID. Right, so the, the actual the actual device though is called the light pen. So you, you all use the pen and then you sign on the um the the tablet there, the sensor, and that produce a uh, electronic signature on the screen that they assigned or they put on your passport or your ID card. Okay. Um so any questions on this? Everybody okay with this? No, the important thing is. You all know what is an input device. You all know what is an output device. But what uh, they're trying to achieve is they want to ensure that students are able to identify uh, appropriate devices given the situation, right? So that's why I have to identify the right device. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if no questions, let's uh, let's move on. Okay. So we have um, uh, 
a diagram here, an oval here, which represents a storage device. Draw and label the sector and track on the diagram. All right, so basically for this, what um, I'm just gonna share another document here. Basically for this, you would draw that a diagram like this. All right, you'll see the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. You'll see the, uh, the answer there. So for the, for the um, tracks is the concentric circles, right? Uh, a sector is a portion of the, the track. Everybody clear on that? Any questions on it? I'm just gonna show the past paper again. <clears throat> All right. Uh, state one secondary storage device that uses sectors and tracks to store data and program. Mm -hmm. So what is a device? What is a secondary storage device that uses sectors and tracks? So a CD. Um, yeah, a CD is one. Anybody else wants to answer? Another? Yeah, Aha, hard disk is another example. All right. No. Compact disk. Correct, yes, a CD. Um, okay, so let's move on. Part three, identify one device interface that is suitable for connecting internal storage devices. So what is an... Uh, uh, an interface on a device that is suitable for connecting internal storage devices. So first of all, internal means it's within your computer, right? It's not going to be something external. So not USB, because that's external. We just discussed our interface in one of the questions earlier. And that's an example of an internet interface. Anybody remembers? SATA is an internal interface. Another internal interface is what? What was the um what was used before SATA? IDE. IDE. Correct. Yes, Nicholas. IDE, right? So IDE is an internal interface. SATA is an internal interface, right? Um, SCSI, SCSI is another one. So any one of those would have been correct. Okay. So that question there was worth another 10 marks. Um, all right. Let's continue with question. Um, five, right? The following scenario describes an example of an automated computerized application in an industrial information processing system. Use the scenario to answer the questions that follow. And this is the scenario in the box, right? This application reads in data about the heat generated in a reactor of an industrial plant. Instructions are sent to a device. Users can determine whether the reactor is working efficiently in regulating the flow of water that cools the reactor. Okay, so that's a description of the, um, the information processing system and the scenario. Based on that, identify one example of data that can be entered. So what is, in other words, what is data that is input?
Okay, remember the application reads data about heat generated in the reactor. So what is it going to read? How do you measure heat? Uh, what is used to measure heat? How do you know? Correct. Yes, yes. Temperature, right? So data that can be entered is temperature of the heat generated. Okay, and what is an input device used to enter this data? Device can be used to, to put this data into the system. What device is used to record temperature? A thermometer, sir. Yeah, so use a thermometer. Right, so one answer could be a thermometer. That's if um, the, it's automatically being read in. Uh, you could also use a keyboard or touchpad to enter the temperature manually. All right, so any of those would have been correct. Um, all right, part B, right? Identify one example of information that is output. Right, so I'll go back to the scenario a little bit. Right, and the application read data about the heat generator in a reactor, instructions and the device. Users can determine whether the reactor is working efficiently in regulating the flow of water that goes the reactor. So after reading in the temperature, what sort of information is output? If the temperature is too high, what do you expect to happen? That's the way I'm looking at it. It would get hot as hell. Um... Yes, so it would get it would get it would be hot and probably um, an alarm or a warning sound, um, maybe output, right? Uh, another thing, it might be uh, some sort of warning message that is printed to a screen, maybe like an alarm. Okay, so any one of those would be um, would be okay. All right. Now, what is a device that could be used to output that? A sensor. Well, the sensor is more for input. It, it reads information, it detects information. So that's more of an input device, but the output. Mm -hmm. So if we are to output the warning sound or the alarm, what device is used for that? If we are to um, view a message, right? Yes, so a speaker. Remember, the speaker will play some, so that's an output device. Now, if it is we have to view a message like a, 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 on a screen, it would be a monitor, right? So that's the answer for the output. Now, part C, right? State whether the processing in the scenario above is batch, online, or real time. Provide one reason for your answer. So it's real time? Yes, it is real time. Now, if you have to give an answer, mm -hmm. I mean a reason for that, what would you give? Because um, like a sensor and stuff, you don't get out online yet. Well, one of the things you want to say about that is for the system, you need to require, um, you, you need to process the data without any significant delay, right? So if it is the temperature is extremely high or crosses some sort of threshold, you want to take the appropriate action immediately. So you need that information in real time as much as possible. All right? So that's the answer for C. 
All right, um, Pardino state one other example of an automated information processing system. So what is another information processing system in, um, that you interact with? And think in deciding this, think about what sort of machine you know about or interact with that takes in um, input from you, does some sort of processing, and then gives you some output. So a printer? A printer, yes, but that's more like a, a device, like a, a, a output device, not like a system. Uh, when you want to want a system, maybe uh, ATM machine is one, you know, you go to the ATM machine, you input your pin, um, you input the uh, uh, you know transaction details for a transaction. If you want to withdraw money, for example, the, the ATM does some processing of that, ensures you have enough funds um, available, and then there's an output where they output the, the cash and also the the receipt. The right. So about for a gas station, so um, a gas station that could that could be one too. You know, you input your your, your payment credit card and then you, you get the gas and then it prints out something so that's one also right uh so right so that's d and tr and part e list three advantages of using an automated information processing system over the corresponding manual one All right so if we use the atm example right what are advantages of using an atm as opposed to going into the bank and you know withdrawing money so one thing definitely will be is that it is faster to use an automated information processing system right um the second thing would be increased efficiency Right, and then so it does majority of the work, yes. Yeah, so, efficiency, yes, increase efficiency, and then thirdly, one of the things you talk about is storage capacity. So, the bank, the ATM machine, for example, has all or can access all the information uh, of everyone's bank account. Okay, so those are those are three advantages of, of using an automated information processing system over uh, a manual system. Right. The best way to answer questions like these or similar to this is think about uh, a, a system you interact with in real life and how that is advantageous. All right, let's move on to question six. All right now, uh, read the following scenario and answer the questions that follow. The BBB company uses a computerized system for ordering items as follows. First point is, the data entry clerk enters the names of the items required and the amount needed on a paper-based request form. Second point, the data entry clerk then enters the data into the computer system. Third point, the administrative assistant re-enters the data from the form into the computer system. The fourth point, the computer system outputs a report indicating if data entered by the data entry clerk is the same as the data entered by the administrative assistant. Um, the fifth point, the administrative assistant makes any corrections as necessary. And the last point, the computer system then produces a purchase request. Okay, so that's, uh, that's basically the flow. Uh, the process for ordering items in this scenario. Now, the first question is, state the technical term for the original document in the scenario. What do you call the original document? What, what do you call the document from point one? The one that the data entry clerk enters the names um, of items required and the amount needed in a paper-based request form.
that is called a source document. Okay, that is a document that is, is initially populated with the information. Okay, so as a source document. Now, state whether the original document is machine readable or human readable. Which one is it? Is it machine readable? And the answer will be no, right? It's human readable because the, um, the data entry clerk has to enter the data in the computer system. So that means the data that is in the document has to be entered in a computer system as opposed to the computer system using the document itself. So it is human readable only, right? Uh, part B, state the technical term used for re-entering the data into the system and explain why this is a useful method. So what is or why would someone enter data twice into a system? So you have to verify if the uh, information is correct or something. Right, so that is to verify, right? So um, the, uh, as to why it is useful, uh, by entering data twice, the program will check the second entry against the first and ensure the data, data matches, right? Uh, and that in this scenario, you have the data entry clerk entering the data and then the administrative assistant re-entering the data. So that's to verify it's, um, it's, it's correct. Now, now we know it's a um, verification method, uh, but what is the name of the verification method? What is the term used in this method? So is it double entry? Yes, double entry or double data entry is the method, okay? So that's the answer for B. Okay. Um, name the file organization structure most suitable to access and store the purchase requests and give one reason to justify the answer. Now, because in this particular example, they're just um, entering information and retrieving information, it seems to be a, a random structure, right, in how they store and retrieve information. And in that way, data can be stored and accessed in, in any order. So there's, there's really no structure like um, to it, no order to it, right? And part D, identify the storage uh, device that is most suitable to store the data from the purchase request and give one reason to justify your answer. So what of storage device would you use to store data from the purchase request? Appropriate answer here would be hard disk, right? Um, and one of the reasons for that would be the large storage capacity of the hard disk. Uh, you'd want to go with that as opposed to probably a, um, a flash drive. Now, a flash drive um, is, is portable, but the capacity may not be large enough. And uh, definitely in terms of uh, a CD or a DVD the hard disk is better than CD requires uh, CD is very portable and again storage capacity is not may not be large enough as well as to copy data onto the CD is is takes a lot more um, effort okay now part e of the question state one data check and explain how it can be used to confirm that the data entered is accurate so uh, the question is what is a data check and how can it be used to confirm data entered is accurate? So I'm going to go back up to the scenario. Uh, 
have a look at it again. And what is a data check that could be performed? So that means you have to name the check and then how it could be used. Anyone wants to suggest a uh, data check? All right, one of the things you could check, right? Now, the steady data entry clerk enters names and then items uh, required. And the amount. So, in terms of data being input, it's three different things names, items required, and amount needed. One of the things you could check is the amount needed. And the first thing is when they enter the amount needed, you can ensure that what they enter is actually a numerical um, value. Okay, so it's a number. And the type of validation check used for that is what? What do you call a validation check to verify is a number or character or both? And that will be data type check, right? So one answer is a data type check. So it could be a data validation data type check and use to ensure that the amount of items entered or what is entered as the uh, amount of items is a numeric value. Uh, another thing when it comes to the amount could be like a reasonableness check, you know, ensuring that the amount entered is not extremely large, right? So that's another one. All right, so the next question here is um, part of section two or the productivity tools, right? Uh, it's, it has a paragraph. So the paragraph reads digital forensics and integrated approach. And then there it was an abstract and there are two paragraphs in this document. Now, the first part of the question is to state three formatting features used in this document. So what are three formatting features you see here? So it has italic, bold, and um, underline. Right, so what it looks like, you see in uh, italics, abstract is, is italic. Uh, the title of the paper is, is bolded, and then this word spiraling seems to be underlined. Okay, uh, the next question, you are to state the number of paragraphs after each of the following tasks is performed. All right, so currently you have two paragraphs and they want to know how many paragraphs will there be if paragraph two is moved below the abstract as the new paragraph one. So you're taking this paragraph and you're moving it below the abstract and it's a new paragraph one. How many paragraphs will there be in the document? Right, so there'll be two paragraphs because you're moving it. You're basically cutting and pasting it. The next part to this question, paragraph one is copied and placed below paragraph one. How many paragraphs will there be? For this question, or this part here, they're taking the first paragraph, they're copying it, and they're pasting it under the paragraph. So you're adding a paragraph. So in this case, it will be three paragraphs. Okay, so ensure that you, any questions on that? Anyone doesn't understand how the paragraphs were determined?
Okay. Um, now, moving on to part three, the reason why the, why the word spiraling was underlined by the software. So the first thing in reading this question is you should identify that this word spiraling was underlined by the software and it is actually not one of the formatting features. So therefore, if you put underlined for, for A1, um, um, you should, you should re remove it and look for another difference, right? So one of the other um, differences here is the font um, size is different between like the paragraph and the heading. So you can remove underline and put font size because you know now that the user didn't underline intentionally spiraling and it was done by the software. Okay, so that's the first point of it. Now the second thing, why would the word spiraling be underlined by the software? Right. So it's better wrong or something. Yeah, so it could be that the word is spelled incorrectly and therefore it's flat. Right? So you could do that. Now, I mean that's that's something in the in the papers to also keep an eye out for. There are some questions that appear in the paper um, that could help with other questions. Right? And you see that here. Because if you are put on the line as one of the formatting features, that would be incorrect. So you definitely could use this to your advantage. All right, the next part to this question, part B, using the search and replace option, all occurrences of cyber are to be changed to cyber crime. Stay the results after this change. So I'm gonna go back to the paragraph. And what they're saying is using search and replace, all occurrences of cyber is gonna to change to cyber crime. So what's gonna happen? So basically what's going to happen here is anywhere that has cyber is going to change to cyber crime, right? And that is going to result in the uh, like document reading like this. As cyber crime crimes, right? So that's going to be the new output. Um, so as cyber crime crimes become more pervasive, right? Um, and this one, this is where cyber is. And this is going to be um, an integral part of the enforcement in tackling these cyber crime crimes, one way. So the impact is, uh, and you could draw examples from the, the document itself, right? All right, so that's it for the question of Microsoft Word. Next question, the paper, is um, consider the following table, which consists of a sample of items in a supermarket, their cost and corresponding uh, backward. Complete the following database structure for the table above. All right, so this is a question based on database management. And basically for each one of the fields, they want to know an appropriate data type for it. So what is an appropriate data type for the item? Yes, text. text is an appropriate data type. What about the cost? So it's appropriate data type, right? And the most appropriate data type for the cost would be currency. There is a number data type, right? But the most appropriate data type is currency because there's a, there's a data type called currency in uh, Microsoft Access. Uh, how about the barcode? What would be an appropriate data type for the barcode? Right. So notice that the barcode has a combination of, it's alphanumeric, right? A combination of letters and numbers. And therefore, an appropriate data type for the barcode would also be text. Okay, so text, currency, and text. Okay. Now, given this table, what is the field that can be used as the primary key? So I'm gonna go back to the table. Which field could be used as the primary key? 
Remember, the primary key is a field in which um, the value is unique in the table. There are no duplicates in the table for this value. Right? And the most appropriate field for this will be the barcode. As you see, it nothing has, there's nothing repeating. Right? Now, um, cost obviously is not one because you can have more than I more than one item having the same cost. Uh, an item also, you could duplicate item, right? There could be two types of water, uh, orange juice, etc. So barcode is the most appropriate. Okay, what about um, part two? A suitable size for the barcode field. What is a suitable size for the barcode field? Remember in Microsoft Access, when we choose a field type or we were defining the field, you had the ability to select the size or indicate what, how much data should be reserved for this field. Uh, that is extremely important because if your um, um, the database, the database actually reserves information or sorry, reserve um, space for the content. Um, so for example, by default, uh, text field might have space or reserve 255 uh, characters for a uh, uh, value of that field, right? But if the names you're using um, is generally um, between 20 to 50 characters long, you might want to use 50 characters for that so similarly for the barcode, we see here that the barcode has six characters. Um, you could put six, or you could put a value that's slightly higher, maybe 10, in case uh, that gives you um, room for a growth later on. All right, uh, the result of a query that finds all items that cost less than $5. So for this question, you're going to run a query on the table and you want to find um, a list of all items that cost less than $5. What would that query um, output? How many items are less than five dollars? Right? Uh, it's only one item, and what is that item? One. Water, right? Yes. Mm. So, yes. So it's one item, and the item is water. So the answer for this is water. No, no. Yeah. If you pay attention to the question, eh? The result of a query that finds all items that cost less than So they don't want to know the number, they want to know the items that will be returned. So you have to put water to get the answer. Now, <clears throat> the last part of that question, the field name and order of the sorted records in the table. So they want to know what field is used to sort the records in this table. So they're telling it's sorted in some way. And what is the um the order in which it's sorted. All right, so first thing you need to do is look at the data and look for uh, a pattern. All right, so generally when you sort, um, it, it will be in some sort of order, right? So uh, like alphabetical order or um, ascending or descending order. So you have orange juice, then grapefruit. So this is definitely, and then water, right? So this is not uh, any sort of alphabetical order. Then you have $6.50, 
you have a number that is higher, 8 to 25, and then you have a number that is lower than the, the first one. So this is going to be so. So the barcode now should be the answer. And you look at it. You start with X, Y, then you go to M, uh, D, and A. So this looks like an order for sure. And in which order? It's in descending order, meaning you start from the, the, the last or the lower letters and then go up the, the higher letters in the alphabet. All right, so that's the answer for this question. And that will be a total of, um, of eight marks. Okay, let's have a look at this uh, problem solving section now. Study the algorithm below and answer the questions that follow. So they have printed out an algorithm. And when it comes to questions with algorithms, yes, that is something you um, still need to understand because that's part of the syllabus, right? So a question like this is something you have to be able to interpret. Right, so this algorithm, this they have a variable called total and they're initializing it to zero. And then they're saying while total is less than equal to five, prompt to enter the name of a subject. Then it's saying if the subject um, was already entered, then prompt to enter another subject. If the total is equal to three, give a 5% discount. And then you add one to total, so increment the value of total. Else, you just increment the um, value of total. Um, you end the while loop and then you display the total. <laughs> the first question is uh, a table to fill out, right? And they have, you have to identify one line in the algorithm which contains each item in the following table. So, which line contains an assignment statement? In which line are you assigning a value to a variable? Right, so we have multiple lines doing this, but the first line actually does it, right? So in the first line, you assign zero to the variable total. So an answer could be line one. Um, okay. Now, which line um, is the start of a loop? Which line in the case is the start of a loop? Line two. Right, line two. Now, in this particular uh, algorithm, uh, there is only one loop, which is the Y loop. And that begins on line two. So that's the start of the loop. Okay. Which line contains an output statement? All right, there are actual multiple actually are multiple lines with output statements, right? Um, line three, line five, and line eleven. Right. So either one of those, right? So you put line three. Remember, prompting the user means you're putting something out on the screen to ask the user for the information. So that's three and five, and line eleven is just displaying the total, putting the total on the screen. Okay. So any one of those would have been correct. Okay. What about a condition? Which line is a condition? Yes, the line six. Yes, so a condition means you're going to be comparing two values or doing some sort of comparison. So we have a couple of lines, right? Um, line four. If the subject is already entered, so they're checking to see if this was entered already. Um, line six, if the total is three, so it's checking the value of total 
the tree. All right, so those are two options. Um, technically, you could say line two because it's comparing total to five, but because there are other options available, don't you use line two because it was used previously, right? And the last one there is a relational operator. Okay, a relational operator is, is used to, to compare values, right? So that is, for example, less than or equal to, not equal to this sort of thing. So again, it could be line six or line two, right? Any one of those. But you can see very easily how this could come, how multiple choice questions could be ask based on this right so they could say um which of these which of the lines below is the start of a loop and they could give you line one line two line four line 11 right and then you have to choose the right right one so questions like this are not only limited to the paper two but could be part of the paper one also right so that's why it's um uh, important to practice or uh, have an idea of the paper two question. Okay, let's move on to the second second part. Right now we have a trace table. Complete the following trace table using the algorithm page on on page eighteen. Right, so we have subject, discount, and total, and we have English B, woodwork, English B, mathematics. So these subjects here will be the input to the algorithm, right? And then you're gonna have discount and you're gonna have total being updated accordingly, right? So let, let, me, let me try to share this in a different way. There's a notepad together with the, the question, right? You all see that here? Everybody see that? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So let me just write this out here to give add some visual. So you have subject, then you have discount, and then you have total. Right? And then the subjects, there were English B, would work English P and the last one was mathematics. Right. So these are your subjects that's gonna be used to input into your algorithm, right? And you have to update the trace table based on um based on the algorithm. So you start off with total being zero, while total is less than five, total is zero, uh, so you enter the loop prompt to enter the subject name. So the person enters subject B, right? Um, if the subject is, is already entered, was this subject entered before? No, it's the first entry, right? So you're gonna skip this then. Now, if the total is equal to three, is the total equal to three? Anybody, is the total equal to three right now? No, total is not true, total is zero. So what discount are you gonna give this person? No discount. So the discount is gonna be zero, you can say zero percent, right? And then 
total equals total plus one. So the total is now equal to one. Everybody understand that? If you don't understand any steps, let me know, right? So the total is one. So you go back up now. While total is less than equal to five, total is one, so it is less than five. Prompt to enter the name of the subject, so they enter in Woodward. Uh, was the subject entered already? No. Right? So you skip this there. Um, if total is equal to three, total is one. Okay, so it's not equal to three. So you're gonna skip this then and you're gonna move to the else. So the discount, they're gonna get zero percent also, and the total now is what correct two right then we go back to the beginning of the loop total is less than equal to five yes it is now two prompt to enter the subject um if the subject is entered already is the subject entered was english be entered before English B was entered before, right? And therefore, you're going to prompt to enter um, another subject, right? So it's going to prompt to enter mathematics, okay? So in this case, the, the for English uh, B, the discount is equal to. Um, is equal to zero percent, right? Right, and the total uh, remains as two. And mathematics now, they they enter mathematics. Is the total equal to three? No, right. So the discount for mathematics again is zero percent, and the total is now equal to three. Everybody okay with that? Right, remember the, yes, sir. the important thing is you have to step through the program and ensure it flows properly, right? So let's, let's get back to the questions. Yeah, right. So let's go back to the question. Right, so that's the trace table. Um, I know we have an, another part of the question here. State one suitable data type for each of the following variables. Um, 20 is assigned to students. What sort of data type should students be, variable students? That's real, sir. That, well, real is definitely an option, right? But because it has no, no decimal or numbers after decimal point, integer will be the, the most suitable data type. Okay? Um, what about fees paid is assigned to the, um, it's assigned Y. Character. Yes, character. Um, some persons might be inclined to use Boolean, but uh, Boolean is used for if you have one of two, right? So either yes or no, they didn't indicate that this is yes or no. So the most appropriate or most suitable would be character. What about average mark equals mark divided by three? So that's new numeric. Uh, well, this one will be real, actually, right? Because if you divide it by three, there's most probably going to have some decim um, some decimal uh, numbers after decimal point. So it's best for um, real for this one. And grade one is assigned fifty six. Integer. That's boolean. That's boolean. No, I don't think so. Didn't he just say boolean is either or? Yeah, boolean is either or. Okay. Right. Um, this one. That's actually, thing, huh? That's string. Well, this one will be something called an array, right? But oh, yeah, um, the array. But just be careful with arrays uh, in the sense that arrays are no longer like valid today in the syllabus, right? So for that, we don't have to worry too much about question okay. arrays coming in the exam. All right. Now, part C, um, identify the variable in part B that is not an elementary data type. Um, the answer for that is array. 
Okay, but again, arrays uh, is not part of the, the new syllabus there. We don't have to talk about that. All right, so let's move. Okay, question 10. Um, question 10 is an algorithm. They give you an algorithm and then they ask you to um, complete Pascal code. So uh, some of you might guess what I'm going to say here. Uh, it will be that this, this is not something you're going to be evaluated on because this is specifically Pascal programming language, right? So nothing is, nothing is required there. there you go. Right, and then question, question 11 is, an, is a programming question, but it is not specific to any programming code it itself, right? It, it reads like this. Consider the programming code in the following table. Example one and two are different versions of the same instructions, right? So they give an instruction and then they have how it could be coded using two different types of um, programming code. And then they ask the state the programming language generation, for example, two, right? So these are different generations. And then after that, they asked to write the generic name of the programming language illustrated in the example. So you have to do, um, you have to decide what that is. Then they give you some code based on the information in table example one, and they tell you to identify the error in the code. That's the first thing. And then they ask you to correct the error stating what should be used. Okay, so you're required to view this code and correct it referencing this table. Uh, the third part of the question talks about some errors, right? And asking to state the technical term <clears throat> for each of the following. Uh, what do you call the original programming code? Uh, what do you call um, locating errors in the program? Uh, the type of error found in part C, which is this one here. You know what you call that? Uh, the conversion of the code uh, or conversion to the code in example two, okay? Um, part four is asking to rewrite the code in C using the instruction column. And uh, part five is um, to write the output when the following data is entered in the code. Now this question, which is question 11, I will also ask you all to do this for homework, right? So for homework, you have question 11 from paper two and questions 55 to 60 from paper one. So that will be homework for next class. And just reviewing the paper here, this last question that they have here, 12, deals with arrays. And arrays is, is um, not part of the syllabus that you will be evaluated on. Okay, so we will skip this question also. All right, so those were the questions I was. Was that clean? That's it. Yeah, uh, so uh, what I was gonna say is those are the questions I wanted to cover in class today. Also, um, let you know the homework, right? The paper two will also be on the shared, um, sorry, on the, on the drive, right? 